right, good morning, DCC family. It's so good to see you guys here with us this morning. We doing all right? Yeah. Good. Hey, do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor, and if they're not wearing green, just give them a little pinch and say, hey, it's St. Patrick's Day, okay? <laughs> if you're sitting next to someone you don't know, welcome. You have a new friend today. I opened the floodgates. What'd I do? All right, guys. Well, look, we're so glad to see you here with us today for the final week of our study through the book of Nehemiah that we are calling Building Forward. A couple of weeks ago, I had something happen to me, an experience that I had, and it's an experience I'm sure that you've had too before in your life. I woke up on a Saturday morning and I decided that I was going to clean the living room. Molly and I waited several years into our marriage to start having kids, and so we have a three-year-old and a newborn, both boys, in the house. And so you can probably imagine what our home looks like half the time. It's absolute chaos. So I go through the normal tasks that morning of straightening up the living room. I put all the toys in a toy box, fold all the throw blankets and put those away. I get all the pillows positioned just perfectly on the couch, and they're fluffed to perfection, right? Because there can't be any sign of living in your house when you clean it, right? It has to look like Disney on ice in five seconds if people are going to come over. So I do all of that. When I was wrapping up, I noticed I had a set of shoes by our couch, and so I picked them up, took them to my bedroom closet, chatted with Molly a little bit about what we were going to do that day. And when I came back into the living room, It looked like the Tasmanian devil had come through there, okay? My three-year-old just acted like a tornado. He pulled out all the toys that were in the toy box. Those third blankets, oh yeah, they're in the floor now. Those pillows that looks great on the couch are just strewn everywhere, and it seems like we're right back to square one. So naturally, I was very frustrated by that, and so I do what you would probably do in that moment. I start picking up all that stuff, cleaning it, only for the same cycle to keep happening all day long. It didn't matter what I did, no matter how many conversations we had or redirections I gave or discipline we decided to do. You know that verse in Proverbs that says, spare the rod and spoil the child? (laughs) Ain't no rod being spared in the Dickerson house that day, okay? That thing was bent. Nothing made a difference, and we were back to square one. But you've been there too before, right? You've cleaned the house to have kids mess it up. You've taken your teenager's car to the car wash to get it all spick and span only for the next week for it to be a train wreck. You know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah, let me move these 10,000 water bottles in my passenger floorboard so you can get in. Anybody ever been there before? Uh, You've all deep cleaned the kitchen only to then cook a meal and then it looked like Gordon Ramsay went on a rampage in there throwing everything around, right? We've all been there. We've all had that happen to us. And in a real way, that's what's happening in Nehemiah chapter 13, the final chapter. In Nehemiah 13, we see that after staying in Jerusalem for 12 years, Nehemiah finally decides to go back to Persia, where he came there from. All of the work had been completed. The wall in the city had been rebuilt. The people had moved back. The church had been opened. And revival and worship was finally taking place that was broken for so long. But while he's away, we see some of the people slip back into some old behaviors and into some old habits that were destroying and damaging their lives. We're going to see what these behaviors were, and more importantly, we're going to see how Nehemiah responds as we seek to navigate situations like this in our own life. This is in Nehemiah chapter 13. I'll start in verse 1 and then drop down to verses 4 through 8. This is on the side screens, and as always, all the notes are available on the DCC app. If you don't have that on your phone, it's a great resource to take advantage of. The Bible says on that day, they read from the book of Moses. That's our equivalent of reading from the Bible. In the hearing of the people. And so the people are gathering together for worship, just like we are today. They're reading and teaching from the Bible, and they're seeing what God would have for their lives. Verse 4 says, Now before this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, and who was related to Tobiah, 
prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem, and I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was, let's all say this together, very angry. So in verses 4 through 5 of chapter 13, we get a glimpse into why some of God's people are slipping back into their old behaviors. And they're slipping back because of a guy we've already met in this study named Tobiah. If you're new to the study of Nehemiah and don't know who this is, Tobiah is a guy who shows up in chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6. And Tobiah is working with a guy named Sambalot to completely oppose everything that Nehemiah is wanting to accomplish and achieve in the city. They're opposing the work of God. They didn't want him to rebuild the city. They didn't want God's people to have a place of worship. And so they did everything they could to distract Nehemiah. They did everything they could to discourage Nehemiah. They did everything that they could to discredit Nehemiah. And they did everything they could to intimidate the people who were partnering with Nehemiah. And these guys, by chapter 13 who opposed everything that they were trying to accomplish for God, have now been given a prominent place inside the house of God. This would be like today, someone who hates God rising to the position of pastor or small group leader or sitting on a board making important decisions. This was not a good situation and all kinds of damage is happening because of that. Not only is Tobiah living in this prominent place in the house of God, but if you look in your Bible in verses 10 through 11, you actually see that the leaders of God's people, like the leaders in the church, okay, are not managing the resources that they have been given to do and accomplish the work of ministry. And people are suffering because of it. Because of all of that, the point is this. At verse 8, when Nehemiah sees this injustice, when he sees this wrong, Nehemiah was angry, okay? How many of you, if you were given a huge project at work and you accepted that project, you built a team for that project, you raised capital and resources for the project, and you put blood, sweat, and tears into the project to get it done only to go two steps back at the end of it and everything be ruined would be angry. Hello, is it just me? That's exactly how Nehemiah felt in this moment. Nehemiah had accepted God's call. He had built a team. He had raised capital and resources. He put blood, sweat, and tears into this project. He relaunched the church. He brought the people back. He sparked a revival and goes on vacation for a couple of weeks. And it's all screwed up by the time he comes back. He is very angry. But like he's done all throughout the entire book, Nehemiah sets a wonderful example on how he deals with that anger and how he uses that anger for the purposes of God. Because Nehemiah was a guy who turned his anger into action. And I need you to see that and understand that today. How many of you, when you get angry, let's just be honest, struggle to channel that anger into positive action in your life. Let me see your hands. Okay, I'm I'm right there with you, okay? What I know about most people is when we become angry, we can respond in a lot of different ways. A lot of people become very passive when they get angry. Where are the passive people in the room today? You don't want to raise your hand because you're passive and you still got to think about raising your hand, okay? So when we become passive, this is a, a deep struggle for me that I have to guard and keep in check. You give people the silent treatment, you know, people like that. Give people the cold shoulder. You give people kind of passing by comments that you know we're going to get under their skin, right? 
It's being passive. And the reason we're passive is because we don't channel that anger into action. For some people, they don't become passive when they get angry. They become explosive when they get angry. How many of you are kind of like that? Explosive. If you think of explosive, explosive cause destruction. So you throw a fit. You throw and break things. You raise your voice or bully and try to intimidate people. They go on a rampage with their words. And they know how to hit you with your words exactly where it hurts to tear you down. This is explosive anger. And it destroys everything in its path. It's because we don't know how to take our anger and channel it, channel it into positive action. For other people, they're not passive or explosive but they just shut down when they get angry. How many of you know people like that or are that person? It's like, hey, I just don't want to deal with this right now. Hey, I'm going to avoid the situation altogether because if I, don't, if I avoid it, I don't have to address it in my life. These are all ways that people respond to anger, but that's not how Nehemiah responded. Instead, what he does is he takes that anger he is feeling And he channels it into positive action and work for the kingdom of God. This is detail city, okay? But I want you to see exactly how Nehemiah responded and how he channeled this anger. It seems bad at first, but we'll make it make sense on the back end. So in verse 8, Tobiah has this place in the church and he hates God. Verse 8, he throws his furniture out, okay? Uh, this wasn't 2020 where there were eviction moratoriums and you could just squat for years on end, right? This was like a bad breakup with your ex where they're throwing your stuff out the top window on the second story. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it was not a good situation. Throws all of his stuff out. Verse 9, Nehemiah cleans the chambers. So, hey, I'm cleaning house. And he actually brings back the resources that should have been in that room and space in the first place for the work of ministry. In verse 11, he confronts the officials, and in verses 12 through 14, he reorganizes the temple. So he pulled his best Donald Trump impression and said, you're fired to all the guys who were leading and harming God's people. But he also hired and established and put the right people in positions to care for God's people. He reorganizes the organization. In verse 17, he confronts the leaders and the noble of Judah. That's kind of the country and nation they're in. And he says, if you were to read that in your Bible, hey guys, like this behavior right here, don't you know that's what your fathers did? And that's why Jerusalem was destroyed in the first place. Don't you know your fathers did that and that's why they lived in shame and exile? Don't you know that's what your fathers did and that's why they had the brokenness and problems they did in their life? That's what he tells them. In verse 19, he closes the gates to Jerusalem and only opens them after the Sabbath. God worked hard for six days and rested for one. What happened was people were trying to keep working on the Sabbath day on Sunday. And he says, hey, if you jokers are going to bring your donkey in with all your goods and try to do business, I'm just shutting the gates, baby. Like, you ain't even getting in here. Verse 21, he warns the merchants of the same thing, reason why he closed the gate. Verse 22, he purified the priests and pastors and Levites Verse 25, he confronted the Jews who were intermarried. We talked about that last Sunday. And in verse 30, he cleanses the people in the temple from everything that was foreign. I know that's a lot, but let's just get real for a second. At first glance, it seems like Nehemiah is being pretty harsh with what he's doing. True? It seems like he is harsh. But it's so important, and I I pray you pick this up today. It's so important we understand that Nehemiah's anger was God-centered anger. It was not self-centered anger. How many of you become self-centered when you get angry? Well, I've been wronged. I've been hurt. I've had my feelings hurt. I've been mistreated. So I want to get even so I can get better. It's self-centered anger. Nehemiah's anger here isn't self-centered, but it is God-centered. He loved these people. 
He wanted these people to experience and thrive in a relationship with God. And he wants to remove anything and remove anyone that's going to prevent those things from happening in their lives because he so loves them and cares about them. Sometimes people will say, hey, it is a sin and it is wrong to be angry. Let me ask you, is it a sin or is it wrong to be angry? Yes or no? No. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 through 27, if memory serves me right, it says, in your anger, do not sin. It's implied that we can be angry about the things that God is angry about, but that anger should not cross the line and lead us to sin against someone or ourselves. This is what the Bible calls righteous indignation. We are angry about the things that God is angry about, and we are going to act on them so that God's will and work can be accomplished in the world. Now, the Bible, we always got to remember, isn't about information, right? We're not here today to get a lot of info download and be a bunch of Bible fatheads and say, oh, look at me, I'm so smart and great. We're here for transformation, okay? We don't want to get into the Bible. We want the Bible to get into us. We want to be changed as a result of what we see today. And with that in mind, I just want to ask you a couple of questions to think about as we see how Nehemiah channeled his anger for positive action. First, I would just ask you this. How often do we go back to things that God has rescued us from? This is what's happening in Nehemiah chapter 13. How many times have you gone back to an addiction after God has rescued you and given you victory from that addiction? How many times have we gone back to a toxic relationship we know we shouldn't be in when God has given us freedom and victory from it? How many times have we gone back to making poor financial decisions after God has given us freedom and victory from that? It's like, hey, we're debt free. Hey, we're not using the credit card anymore. But come on, man, it's just three payments on afterpay, okay? Like, it's not that big of a deal. How often do we do things like that? It's one thing to look at Nehemiah 13 and their lives and blame them and make fun of them. It's another thing to be open and honest about our own lives and our struggles so that change can occur and positive action can take place. And I will just caution you today as your pastor because I love you and I care about you. Don't ever let the blessings of God cause you to forget God in your life. Our God's a great God. I believe our God wants to bless you tremendously in your life. But never let those blessings he gives you lead you to forget the one that gave you those blessings in the first place. That safeguards us from slipping back and making the same mistake they're making here in this moment. My second question is this, and I'll kind of land the plan for the day here. How can you turn your anger into positive action. Like, how can we do that? How can you, how can I turn our anger into positive action? The answer to the anger you experience in your life, DCC, the answer to the anger you have because of the problems in the world is not to become passive, it's not to become explosive, and it's not to just shut down. But it is to act on that anger so that positive change can take place. In a real way, what is happening here is we have come full circle from exactly where we started in the book of Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah receives news that the city of Jerusalem had been destroyed. He gets news that the people of God had walked away from God. He gets news that their place of worship had been destroyed. And rather than just being frustrated by it, he decided to do something about it. In Nehemiah 13, 10 weeks later in this study, Nehemiah yet again receives news that the city of Jerusalem was in turmoil. The people of God were slipping away from God and falling back into old patterns. 
And rather than being frustrated by it, he decides to do something about it. And that's what I want for you. How can you channel that anger to enact positive change? Let's just be honest, in our city, in our country, and in our world right now, there are plenty of things to be angry about. True? Hello? Am I the only one? And like I told you all the way back in week one, listen to me. We should not just be frustrated by the brokenness in our world. We should do something about the brokenness in our world. And that right there is exactly why we are building forward. Here's what I want you to see. Because of everything that happened in this book, because of everything that Nehemiah did, lives were changed because of the work that Nehemiah did. For 142 years up until this point, Jerusalem had lay in ruins. For 142 years up until this point, God's people lived in shame and exile. For 142 years, there was great brokenness in their community and brokenness in their city. But because Nehemiah acted on the call that God had given him, because he turned his anger into action, the city was rebuilt, lives were changed, legacies were transformed, and eternal destinies were altered. All because of this amazing work that he decided to do. As we close what has been an amazing study in this great book of the Bible, as we look forward to the future that God has for DCC, I want to let you know that lives were changed because of the work that Nehemiah did. But gang, lives will be changed because of the work that we do here today. Over the last six weeks, you have heard about this project we're doing called Building Forward. You've heard about how we're running out of room, we're seeing record crowds, and we are witnessing decisions for Jesus every single weekend. You've heard about how we need to create more space to reach more people for Jesus in a county where 90% of our population does not have a church home. And today, I am calling you and I am asking you to partner with us in this project. DCC, like Nehemiah, it is time for us to turn our anger into action. It is time for us to do something that no other church is doing so that we can reach people that no one else is reaching. It is time for us, like Jesus said, to be the light of the world, to be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. It is time for us to shine the light of Christ in a dark, hurting and broken world. It is time to build a place where people who have been sidelined and broken by sin can find freedom, hope, and victory in Jesus' name. And it is time for us to take this vision that God has given us and take the steps for it to become a reality. There are people in our community who are stuck in a cycle of sin. And they think that's who they always will be and they think that's what they will always do. And like Nehemiah, we have an opportunity to build something amazing that will far outlive us to show people that there's a church in Prestonsburg that loves them, is for them, is not against them, and wants to introduce Jesus to them for generations to come. And so as we close our services today, we're getting ready to take a special offering at the end of service. As we prepare for that, I'm just going to ask our band to go ahead and come back out on stage and lead us in a powerful song that's called The Blessing. Gang, our, our prayer for this building is that it would be a blessing to our community. Amen. Our prayer for this building is that it would bless people and families and lives for generations to come in a way that far outlives us. And as they lead us in this song, I want us to use this time as a time of prayer. If DCC is your church home, okay, if you're visiting, I love you. I'm thankful you're here. I ain't talking to you right now. If DCC is your church home, if you're bought in, committed, and a part of the family, use this song as a time of prayer. 
thank God for the amazing things he has done in our church and ask God what he is leading you to give to this project as we look towards the future of our church. If DC sees your church home and you haven't taken time to fill out a pledge form, there's one of those in the seat back in front of you. Now would be a great time to pray on what God would have you to give if you haven't made that decision yet. Just grab one of those cards and ask God, what would you have me give to this project to make an impact for your name and for your kingdom? And if any of you hit the lottery recently and just want to cut a check for 300 grand, I'll do a somersault up here on stage for you. And if you want to be anonymous, that's okay too. I'm fine with that. I just want to say this, guys. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. It is an honor to be your pastor. It is the privilege of my life to serve alongside you and witness what God is doing in this city and in this community. And I believe that as we follow this vision God has given us, as we build forward and create more space to reach more people for Jesus, I believe that lives will be changed and an impact will be made for all of eternity. And I hope that you will join us in that work today. And so I'm going to ask you guys to stand. I'm going to pray for us. Our band will lead us in this song and just use this time as a time of prayer and make those final decisions on what God is leading you to give and how he wants you to partner with us. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the hope that he gives us in our lives. We thank you for the lives Jesus has changed throughout the history of DCC. And Father, as we build forward, we are expectant on the lives that Jesus will change as we make more room to reach more people for Jesus. Just pray that your spirit would speak to your people now on how they could partner with us in this way. And I pray that we would trust you with the results and your provision in your way and in your time. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Let's sing together.